Let us delve into the book of Hebrews again. Our overall title, Substance and Shadow. I have titled this chapter, Falling Away. And before we commence, let us open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are studying your word together with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you will help us and enlighten us and give us the gems that we need to discover. In Jesus' name, Amen. Why do we call it falling away? Because this is a chapter with a very serious warning. So chapter 6 is actually a frightening chapter to some people. And a wrong understanding of what is said can lead to depths of despair and indeed many a soul has been terrified by what they believed it said. John Bunyan, one of them, at some time also despaired at these verses, but when he studied the history of God's people and the sins of the greatest of these, his hopes revived. So we have to be very careful because it is easy to take a verse rest it from its context and then use it to bludgeon people into submission and to create fear. Uh, in the Middle Ages this was a very good weapon to use. Before we start therefore with uh, the warnings in chapter 6, let's first look at some of the promises of God so that we are fortified to approach these verses. Psalm 77 verse 7 says, Will the Lord cast off forever? Again, it's a rhetorical question. And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? So here we have rhetorical questions, the answer to each one of these obviously is no. And I said that in my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. So sometimes we get into positions where things are not going well. And it is at those times that we tend to forget how God led us in the past. Verse 12 says, I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. So that is the solution to those times of depression, is to meditate on the word, remember what happened in the past, remember how God led you or led us in the past, and talk of his doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Here's a, another little nuance, another little gem that tells us if you want to understand how God operates, study the sanctuary. Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength amongst the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. And if you look at the sons of Jacob and the sons of Joseph, 
Well, that history is not very, <laughs> very bright. Now, if we could just cast our mind back to what we did last time in chapter 5, Paul admonished the Hebrew believers to turn from the spiritual milk that they were imbibing. And uh, uh, they had to go to stronger food necessary for Christian growth. So now in chapter 6, he exhorts them to transcend the elementary principles of the faith and to search deeper into the mysteries of Christ. And that's what we should do. Some people are just so satisfied with mediocrity. When there is a whole world to discover out there, they are quite happy to sit within a small circle of knowledge. So these opening verses are very interesting when we come to chapter 6. He says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now what does that mean? Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Should we neglect the principles of the doctrine of Christ? Obviously not. That's not what he's referring to. He's talking about the elementary principles, the general things that we know. We shouldn't just stay there. They are important. They are like a foundation that you build on. You don't discard the foundation thereafter. You carry on with the building, but you must make sure that the foundation is sound. But you don't stay there, otherwise you won't have a house. So if we, leave, we should leave those elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, and we should move on to perfection. In other words, there is more to discover, and perfection we find only in Christ. So we need to delve deeper. And then he says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Is there anything wrong with repentance from dead works? Absolutely not. So when you have discovered the truth and you have repented of your sins and you have developed faith towards God, is that enough? Do we stay there? Of the doctrine of baptisms, now this word baptisms here is a unique word and it implies the washings, it implies maybe even uh, the baptism of John as practiced in the time of the Jews. So it is more than one particular baptism. The laying on of hands, this was a very prominent activity in the early church and thereby authority was transferred, but you also laid hands on sacrificial animals, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of the eternal judgment, and this will we do if God permits. So basically what Paul is saying in verses 1 to 3 is now that you've learnt the elementary principles of Christianity, now that you have realized that you have to repent from dead works, that you have to develop faith towards God, that you've gone through the baptisms and understand what all of these issues meant, the laying on of hands, have received the Spirit in order to enable you to preach Christ effectively. You know about the resurrection of the dead. Remember the Sadducees and the Pharisees were at loggerheads about these things. So you understand these doctrines and you understand the eternal judgment, what is the outcome of rebellion. Yes, those things are all important and we do those things. If God permits us, we should then go on to a higher ground. We have to ask ourselves, how many in the church are satisfied with doctrine? knowing, well, the Ten Commandments are binding, the Sabbath still stands, there's a judgment coming, and we know all of these doctrines, but there's no life. Because you take those doctrines and you make them a ritual as verily as what the Jews made it a ritual. So under the Old Testament regulations, there were certain typical rituals that pointed to a greater reality. And we need to study them. We cannot just stick with a ritual. 
And so, well, God commanded that we perform this ritual, so let's get on with it and do it. What does it mean? How does it lead to spiritual growth? We must study deeper. We cannot stay with the elementary. We must go to the sublime. So these included washings, baptisms, the laying on of hands onto sacrificial animals, typifying faith towards God, and in the promise of the Savior, who would stand as mediator for us in the judgment. And when these activities became rituals, they lost their power to convict and deteriorated into ceremonies. Let us go on to perfection. Let us internalize the reality which is Christ and his righteousness. And then come the frightening verses that many have uh, misconstrued to some extent. And these deal largely with those that had been enlightened as to the meaning of these rituals, that had turned from them to the glorious light only to return to the wallow of formalism, rejecting the truth as it is in Jesus. Many of the Jewish nation had been almost persuaded, but closed their eyes to the truth. But the ones in the following verses had been enlightened. So this is the whole purpose. Because people are so inclined to go with the masses and stick to ritualism that they are afraid to venture into that sublime area, that aha moment when we understand what these things mean. And in the book of Hebrews, Paul warns them, why is it you want to stick with the milk? Why don't you go on to solid food? And I think that very same question should be asked of the church in our age as well. So let's look at those verses. Hebrews 6 verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, and they fall away, to renew them again in, unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Now what does this mean? It is impossible for those who were once enlightened. In other words, he's not talking to ignorant people. He's talking to people that were once enlightened. They received a knowledge of the truth. Not only did they receive it, they tasted of the heavenly gift. In other words, they partook of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So some of those early Christians that had come out of Judaism that experienced the Pentecost experience and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They had been part and parcel of it and have tasted the good word of God. They were preaching it and the power of the world to come. They had exercised that power, trampled on scorpions as it were. If they shall fall away, now, is it possible? Well, we spoke about it last time. Even the disciples, even the disciples that had been enlightened, that had tasted the heavenly gift, that had been partakers of the Holy Ghost, that had tasted the good word of God. In other words, they had internalized Christ. They had been with him for three and a half years and had exercised the powers of the world to come, even they were inclined to go back to the ritualism. Even they. And some were not corrected, or were not willing to be corrected, and went back to the wallows. It's like a pig returning to its wallow, or a dog returning to its vomit. And they crucify... Christ afresh and put him to open shame. 
So this is a very serious issue. It can happen, and it can happen to all of us. And many, many in the church today are in the same position. Their religion has become a ritual. You go to church on a Sabbath, you believe in the resurrection, you believe all of these things, but you haven't internalized what it really means. So if we had to sum it up, in my own words, I would say they had been enlightened. We understand that from the verses. They were partakers of the outpouring of the Spirit. They had been convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. They had experienced the power of the gospel. They had tasted the word of God, but sadly they had not internalized it. And when the Spirit pleaded with them, they returned to the formalism of rites and ceremonies, denying the power thereof. So in other words, they clung to the shadow, denying its substance. They fell away. It's not good enough to have a head knowledge. If that head knowledge is not applied to the heart, then we are in serious danger. There is a vast difference between falling and falling away. Now, and this is where our hope lies. We must remember that the words that Paul used in those verses is falling away. But there is a vast difference between falling and falling away. For example, Moses fell, Jacob fell, Samson fell, David fell, Solomon fell, Peter fell, and I could go on endlessly with that list, but they did not fall away. And that is the crux of the matter. Their falling was temporary. Falling away is permanent. Then it becomes impossible to come back because you have crucified Christ again. So we need to understand the difference between falling and falling away. Those who fear that they fall into the category of these verses show sure signs that they do not apply to them. When conscience is silent, then we should fear. Let me give you an example. I once had a young lady that came to me and said that her life was over, it was finished. She had committed the sin against the Holy Spirit and was lost for all eternity. She had fallen away. I asked her why she felt like that, and she wanted to tell me, and I said, no, I don't need to know the details. I'm not a priest that needs to be confessed to, but why do you feel that you have gone too far? No, she went too far in whatever it was that she felt she transgressed in. And so I said, and, and you feel bad about it? And she said, yes, I feel incredibly bad about it. And I feel that I am lost. And I said, well, the very fact that you feel so bad about it means that you are not lost. Because it means that the Holy Spirit is still speaking to you. And if the Holy Spirit is still speaking to you, then you have not committed the sin against the Holy Spirit. In any case, the sin against the Holy Spirit is saying that that which is from God is from the devil. So to a large extent, some of the religious leaders in the time of Christ, when they accused him of being of the devil and performing his works by the power of the devil, they were dancing on the edge of the sin of sinning against the Holy Spirit. So in other words, if you say that that which is from God is from the devil, that is where your danger lies. So she had not fallen away. She had fallen. But so had Moses, and so had Jacob, and so had Samson, and so had David, and so had Solomon, and so had Peter, etc. So we need to understand what these verses actually mean. Because God does not contradict himself. With him there is an abundance of forgiveness. Psalms 130 verse 3 says, If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Then nobody would be saved. 
but there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. So we must balance the word of God with the promises, the warnings and the promises. Now, the promise is not an excuse for sin. But if you take the sin of David, for example, I mean, that was a pretty drastic sin. Not only did he commit adultery, he committed murder. And he contemplated on his bed how to commit this murder and get away with it. It was a most heinous crime. But he repented with a real, real repentance, a sorrow for his sin. And the Lord did not mark his iniquity. Did he sit with consequences? Yes, he did. It affected his entire reign. But nevertheless, his iniquity was not marked against him. So John Bunyan was once perplexed by these verses in the book of Hebrews and he writes in his book, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners. Now began my heart again to ache and fear I might meet with disappointment at last. Wherefore I began with all seriousness to examine my former comfort because he had become relaxed in his Christianity. And to consider whether one that had sinned as I had done might with confidence trust upon the faithfulness of God, laid down in those words by which I had been comforted and on which I had leaned myself. But now were brought those sayings to my mind, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Quoting here Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. So these great reformers, they all went through the same situations as any Christian following in their footsteps. He continues, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment and a fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Quoting Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and 27. As Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And he's quoting Hebrews chapter 12. So he's mulling these verses over in his mind. And then came the thought. Will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forever more? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger shut up his tender mercies? So t quoting the Psalms we just read. And uh, everybody goes through these struggles. Are there any more promises in Psalm 77? Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forever more? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger shut up his tender mercies? And I said, this is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Contemplate how he led in the past and we will not fail to be able to face the future. Verse 11 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. 
We have the same advice in the spirit of prophecy. We have nothing to fear for the future, lest we forget how God led us in the past. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Don't go and sit in a bundle of misery. Get up and speak about the things of the Lord and the Lord will raise you up. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength amongst the people. Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. And that we must not forget. God didn't purchase us with the agonies of Gethsemane and the cross to give us up. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So if we feel inadequate and weak, that's the best position to be in. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So if I may sum up, I would say that the fearful passages do not apply to those who wrestle with God over their shortcomings and failures, for the Holy Spirit has not left them but is still pleading with them. It is when the voice of conscience is silenced and good is called evil that the application can be made for God will not. And then Matthew 12 verse 20 gives what God will not. A bruised reed shall he not break. A smoking flax shall he not quench till he sent forth judgment unto victory. God will not crush out that last bit of fire that still smolders. No, he will rekindle it if we allow him to do so. So it is by the fruits that we must judge. If somebody is depressed, if somebody is in a, in a state of turmoil, that person needs a helping hand. We must be able to distinguish between the fruits. So if we carry on with chapter 6 verse 7 in the book of Hebrews, we read, For the earth which drinketh in rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. So have a look how the plants grow, and look at the growth of those that we wish to criticize or correct. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned up. So is this herb that is growing, this plant, is it useful? Is it struggling? Does it bear fruit? Or does it bear thorns and briars? But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Even though he admonishes them, he also encourages them. So he says, I'm persuaded that there are better things than what I have been complaining about, but, you know, just shake up. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister? Yes. Many of us minister and do good works, but good works are not going to get us to heaven alone. I'm not saying don't do the good works. Of course do the good works. But that should not be the entire focus of your religion if it doesn't transcend to a higher level of gratitude towards God and your good works are a consequence of that gratitude towards God, then they stay with works and will lead to nothing. That's where the philanthropists in this world are that believe that they can continue to sin, even publicly sin, and then make good with philanthropy. That means nothing. 
Verse 11 says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. So don't stop doing good works. Don't stop ministering to the, to the saints. Do what is right, but grow in your Christian experience. So faith and patience can alone inherit the promises. Only when Abraham had patiently endured did he receive the promise. Verse 15. So if we continue with verse 12, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherited the promises. Don't give up. If you fall, get up. Keep on. Do the good works which do not bring you salvation but are a consequence of salvation. Even if Rome says that that is an anathema. Verse 13 says, For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. Saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now if you think about it, how long did he have to wait for that promise? Did he get discouraged when there was no son born to Sarah? Yes, he did get discouraged. Did he try to solve the problem himself? Absolutely. Did he get into trouble because of it? Absolutely. But eventually the promise did come even though he believed it was way too late because she was past childbearing. For men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So when people on earth make an oath and say I swear that this is so and so or this and this will be done then that is the greatest affirmation that they can give. But God swore by himself, and there can be nothing greater than that. When God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. So who does this promise for? Is it only to Abraham? No, it says to heirs of the promise. Now who are the heirs of of the promise. Those who have the faith of Abraham are heirs according to the promise. So this promise stretches all the way to spiritual Israel. It stretches to you and it stretches to me. So those that are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing cannot comprehend the value of the promises. In fact, if the kingdom of God is not our great desire, then our connection with God is tenuous to say the least. And uh, if you think about that, how many people when you say, I believe Jesus is coming soon, will immediately answer, no, 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 that's not going to happen. It's still a long way off. But remember it is the wicked servant who says, the Lord delays his coming. In the spirit of prophecy we read, if we rely upon the promises of God as given in his word, we may with assurance go forward in spite of discouraging appearances. The Lord will raise up helpers in men whom he will move upon by his spirit to impart us in our necessity. Every lawful scheme for advancing the work of saving perishing souls will be a success. Isn't that an amazing promise? We find it in the word as well. My word will not return to me empty. We are to see and acknowledge the working of God's special providence. The Lord authorizes us to pray declaring that he will hear the prayer of those who trust, not in their finite wisdom, but in his infinite power. He will answer the prayer. Even if it seems as if he is not answering the prayer, that is answering the prayer. He will be honored by those who draw nigh to him, who faithfully do his service. 
Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. This is why I believe the book of Hebrews is so important for the time in which we live. It has warnings, but it has tremendous encouragement as well. Hebrews 11.16, if we can jump ahead a little bit, says, But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now I know this is Hebrews chapter 11, but it fits in here with the thoughts of Hebrews chapter 6. And I, I'm always astounded by this verse because it says, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? For has prepared for them a city. That's amazing. In other words, if you long with all your heart for this world, and you cannot wait for the coming of the Lord, you want to be there and no longer here, if you have that mindset, then God is not ashamed to be called your God. That's quite an interesting one. In other words, it is trials and difficulties and rejection and sickness that is often the incentive to long for a better country. So God sometimes allows rejection. He allows sickness. He allows all of these incentives so that there is a longing for a better country. And if we look at the world today, anybody who looks at this world today, surely they must long for a better country. And why is it that they want to change this one into the country of their dreams or when we can see it going to perdition? But love for God and His righteousness is a better motive. So, in other words, do you long for a better country because this one is just so miserable? Or do you long for a better country because you want to be with God? Nevertheless, to be stripped of worldly anchors is often what it takes to bring us to the better path. So basically we can say, O oh, blessed loss that teaches us the value of true wealth. Sometimes we don't realize the value of true wealth until we lose wealth. God's promises are immutable. God cannot lie. He confirmed the promise with an oath to the highest authority in the universe, namely himself. And by three promises he bound himself. The promise of the land, the seed, and the blessing to all who had faith of the faith of Abraham. We who are the spiritual seed of Abraham are blessed with him. So this promise of the seed is very important because Paul in other places says it is singular. It refers to Jesus Christ. So Romans 4 verse 16 says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So God's promises are reliable. They are immutable. We must cling to these promises. We must hold on for dear life. They are solid. They are unchanging. They are a sure anchor. And if we would exercise our faith, then we would discover that all of these words are absolutely true. Second Corinthians 6 verse 10 says, As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Seems like a contradiction in terms, but it is absolutely true. Sorrowful about the situation in the world, sorrowful about our own situation, but still having this hope, rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17, when God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. 
that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to hold upon the hope that is set before us. Two immutable things. There was the promise and there was the oath. Now if God makes a promise, that is immutable. If God confirms it with an oath, it is even more immutable, if that were possible. So hope is linked to faith. Faith accepts as fact that which is not seen, but hope anticipates that it will accrue to you. So the Bible is full of promises. And the Bible tells you to appropriate the promises by faith. And if you have hope, then you believe that those promises actually are for you. I'm always interested when people say, Please pray for me because, you know, I don't have that connection with God. If you, feel, if you feel that way, then you should read the texts where God says that he knows even the sparrow that falls. And the faintest cry of the weakest of his saints is the one that rings loudest in his ears. It's not the proud Pharisee who gets his attention. It's that other one that gets the attention. So however relationship stands above the material. So your relationship is the priority. Develop a relationship. How do you develop a relationship? By walking with that person. By communing with that person. By experiencing that what that person is saying actually has substance. That's how you develop faith and trust. If you don't put your foot in the Jordan, you'll never know that the waters can recede. So let me put it this way. Longing for a house is subordinate to longing for a home. If your situation here is bad and you want a better situation, or your wealth is gone and you want to live in a world where there is no problem in terms of wealth, that's not a good enough motive. It's like a house, wanting a house, but it's better to long for a home. A house without a relationship to fill it can never be a home. So our ultimate home comes from our relationship with God. And we have to practice that here on this earth so that when we get to heaven, we already have a relationship. So coming face to face with Jesus is the ultimate hope. Now we always have a chiasm that we discuss in each chapter. So let's have a look at the chiastic structure in chapter 6. And again it has a structure ABC and the reverse. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And if we go to the antithesis of that, Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto us the heirs of the promise, in other words, those who inherit the promise. So in A, you have inherit the promise, and in verse 17, you have heirs of the promise. The immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. So we have the sandwich structure. Then we go to B, Hebrews 6, 13, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. So if we drop down to verse 15 and 16, the counterpart, and so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater. So you have the same wording. You have the promise, you have the swearing, you have the greater. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. So now the sandwich brings us to the meat in the sandwich, C. Saying, surely blessings I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. So the promise is the center, and what surrounds it is 
the promise and the oath and the substance of the promise is in the center. A chiasm is a, is a marvelous literary style. And it's such a pity that humanity has lost this kind of writing style. So concerning the promise and the oath to Abraham, Wesley comments on Hebrews 6 verse 18, and he says that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in either much more in both of which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, swallowing up all doubt and fear who have fled after having been tossed by many storms to lay hold on the hope set before us. And what is that hope? On Christ, the object of our hope, and the glory we hope through Him. We often hear these stories of children that are in a predicament and their fathers or their parent has promised to bring aid and they patiently wait for that parent to come and help them. And that's the kind of relationship we must have. That's why God gave us this family relationship, so that we can learn to trust. Such a pity that so many people usurp this privilege, so that there's a relationship between the husband and the wife and between the children and the, and the parents. And that must be a relationship of trust absolute trust, the same trust that we must have in Christ. 1 Timothy 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Our hope lies in a person, not in a thing. Abraham was longing for a city whose builder and maker was God. But is it the city that he wanted? What if there was no one in the city? It would be a pretty lonely place. Now our hope is with a person and the whole object of the book of Hebrews is substance. And that substance is always Christ. 1 John 3 verse 3 And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he, Christ, is pure. Revelation 1, 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos. Why was he there? Listen carefully. For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. To the law and to the testimony. It will be exactly the same at the end. We will be banished to the antitypical Patmos because we stand for the law and the testimony. James says, Be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. So we continue with Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Be sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil. In other words, you have direct access to the mercy seat of God. In the veil, come to the mercy seat of God. Come to the throne of grace. Confess your sins. Do those things which are the foundation of Christianity, but grow beyond them, and don't fall back into formalism and make your religion a ritual. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And we said we will say more about Melchizedek in chapter 7. So our hope must be based on the promises of God and only then can they be an anchor for the soul. God's promises are reliable and they are immutable. We go to John chapter 14, which is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is what Abraham longed for. He longed to be with those mansions, not because there was a building there, but because there was an occupant that he could commune with. And whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, if you have this relationship, if you internalize that bread, that manna, then you know the way. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what in chapter 6 seems to be daunting to many a soul is actually the greatest promise in the entire scriptures. So let us not be discouraged. Let us work while there is a day to work. Let us preach. Let us remember the promises of God. Let us internalize the promises of God. Let us appropriate them to ourselves. And let us with longing wait for that city which God has promised will be the abode of those that love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the promises of God which are immutable and which are confirmed with an oath which do not only apply to Abraham but apply to all those who have the faith of Jesus. Help us to be faithful servants and to preach the message while there is still time and hope. In Jesus' name, amen.